Good morning. Welcome to Royal City Community Church. We're so glad that you could join us today. We're going to be continuing our study in the book of Hebrews. Uh, last week we uh, started to get into chapter 9 and we're going to delve a little further into that today. Uh, but just before we begin, let's just open up with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for today. We thank you again for the privilege that we have to be found in your presence. And Holy Spirit, we just thank you for what you're going to reveal to us as we get into this uh, chapter 9 of Hebrews, just talking about uh, the new covenant and all that that has done and purchased for us, Lord God. And we just thank you for what you want to reveal to each heart today. We thank you for this time. We pray that you bless each one. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen. All right, so we left off. We went through chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 10 last week. And we were talking about the characteristics of the old covenant. We broke that down by looking at the old sanctuary, the old services, and the old significance. And we're going to try to get through to about verses 15 or 16 today from chapter 9, verse 11. And we'll find today that a lot of the characteristics of the new covenant already have been mentioned or implied in the discussion of the old. But the, the writer here focuses on several that are especially important in contrast in the two covenants. And following the pattern that was used in showing the inadequacies of the old covenant in verses 1 through 10, uh, the new sanctuary, the new services, and the new significance are briefly described in verses 11 through 14. Uh, as always, the, uh, the point is not to de demean the old, but to show its shadowy incompleteness. In fact, these verses, to paraphrase these verses, and we're going to break these verses down, obviously, but if you're going to take the whole verses 11 through 14, to paraphrase these verses, the Holy Spirit is saying, if these old things were so good as symbols, how much, how much better are the real things that they symbolize? If the external, physical, and temporary covenant accomplished its purpose so well, how much better will the internal, spiritual, and eternal covenant accomplish its purpose? So let's look at verse 11. Or in chapter 9, verse 11 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So first of all, Christ as our heavenly high priest, has an infinitely greater sanctuary in which he's able to minister. The old tabernacle was designed by God, but of course we know it was made by men. And it was made out of the materials that would have been present for them at that time to be able to build it. Um, and on the inside where only the priests could go, uh, it undoubtedly um, was also very, very beautiful. Um, but it was only a tent. Now, it's not mentioned here in these verses, but the temple in Jerusalem, which, was, of course, was built once they were established there, um, though immeasurably more uh, magnificent than the tabernacle, of course, which was uh, built in the, in the wilderness, was also made, again, referring to the, to the, to the uh, temple, was also made by men and materials from the present creation and was subject to the deterioration and destruction to which everything of this creation is subject. So the new sanctuary, however, uh, which is what we're talking about here, we're talking about the new sanctuary. The new sanctuary is not made by men or on earth or by earthly materials. It is made by God in heaven of the heavenly materials. This new sanctuary, in fact, to put it very simply, is heaven. Earth belongs to God, but heaven is his dwelling place. His throne and his sanctuary. You can actually look at Acts 7, 48 through 50 and Acts 17, verse 24. As the writer in Hebrews has pointed out many, many times, Jesus Christ, like Melchizedek, is a present king. And he rules and ministers from the same place. His sanctuary and his palace are the same. And in this passage, of course, the emphasis is on his sanctuary. Heaven is the perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. Christ ministers for us in heaven, in the throne room of God, at God's right hand. You know, the former priests had to go into the holy place by themselves, for the people, but not with the people. The same was true of the high priest in regard to the holy of holies, where he could not even take other priests, but our heavenly priest takes his people with him, that's us, 
all the way into the sanctuary. He takes us into the sanctuary of sanctuaries, into heaven itself. Not into the symbolic presence of God, but into the real presence of God. Not only has he gone before us, but he takes us with him. Now, we're believers. If we're born again, he's already, he already has taken us with him. But God, this is uh, Ephesians, 4, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when we were saved, at that time, Christ took us into the Father's presence, where spiritually speaking, we already live with him, okay? And will forever live with him. We're seated in those heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We know that, the authority that we have. We live right now in that heavenly place, in the presence of God, in his throne room, and in his sanctuary. As, as uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, our citizenship is in heaven. Now brings us to number two, uh, and it's described in verse 12, the new services. Let's look at verse 12. And verse 12 says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all. Okay, so how does Christ minister in that heavenly sanctuary? What does he do as our eternal high priest? Well, he does three things. Very briefly, number one, his service is in his own blood, not that of sacrificial animals. The sacrificer, to put it this way, the sacrificer was the sacrifice. Secondly, he made his sacrifice only once, and that once was sufficient for all the people for all time. Hallelujah. And number three, he obtained permanent eternal redemption. He cleaned past, present, and future sins all in that one act of redemption. Let's go on and look at verse 13 and talk about the new significance. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All right, so if the old covenant, you know, and, and as weak as and, and as imperfect as it was, served its purpose, how much better will Christ's new covenant be? How much more powerful and how much more perfect and how much, you know, sort of what other word you can use to describe it? The new not only has a better purpose, but accomplishes its purpose in a better, more perfect way. The purpose of the old sacrifice was to, to symbolize externally the cleansing of sin. It accomplished this purpose. The purpose of the new sacrifice, however, was to cleanse actually internally where sin really exists. It accomplished its superior purpose in a superior way. You know, there's a hymn that was written by Isaac Watts. I don't know what year that was written, but it's called Faith in Christ Our Sacrifice. And some of the words go like this. I think, in fact, I think the first two verses. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. That was verse one and verse two, but Christ the heavenly lamb takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. See, Jesus did everything. Everything he did on earth in obedience to the Father, he did it through the Spirit. Even, even in fact, especially in his supreme sacrifice. He, through the, the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God. And in doing so, he provided the cleansing of our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Hallelujah. He frees our consciences from guilt. I mean, that, that's a joy and a blessing that no Old Testament saint ever had or could possibly have had. In Christ, we can draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's chapter 10 and verse 22 of Hebrews. See, the, the former priests cleaned up the outside. And even that only symbolically 
imperfectly and temporarily. But Christ cleanses from the inside. And of course, we know that's where the real problem exists, okay? He does more than cleanse the old man, amen? He replaces it with a new man. He cleanses our conscience, but he recreates our person. In Christ, we are not cleaned up old creatures, right? But we are redeemed, redeemed new creatures, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us. You know, there's a story that an evangelist tells years and years and years ago, the days when he held tent meetings. And one day, after a series of meetings was over, he was, he was pulling up the tent stakes. He was done with the meetings, and uh, a young man approached him and asked what he had to do to be saved. The evangelist looked up at Adam and answered and said, sorry, it's too late. And, and the young man, his response was, oh no, like, you mean it's too late because the services are over and done? No, the evangelist answered and said, no, I mean it's too late because it's already been done. See, everything that could be done for your salvation has already been done. And after he explained Christ's finished work to that young man, he led him to the Lord. He led him to saving faith in Christ Jesus. See, our salvation is based on the covenant whose redeeming work is finished. Amen. On a sacrifice that has been offered once and for all that is complete and perfect and eternal. Praise God. Let's go on to verse 15. It says, and, and for this reason, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Okay, now, and this reason in verse 15 uh, refers back to what has just been said, namely that Christ, because of his sacrificial death, had become the mediator of a new and better covenant. By God's standard of righteousness and justice, the soul that sins must die. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 tells us that. The only way a person could come to God was to have the penalty for his sin paid. This payment Jesus has provided for everyone who trusts in him. In so doing, he became, uh, if I could put it this way, he became the bridge. He became the mediator, the only mediator between God and men. And, you know, he accomplished in that one act what the work of the old priest only symbolized in, in those very many uh, repeated times that they had done that. Jesus' supreme act of, of, of meditation, or sorry, of mediation, pardon me, meditation, mediation was his own death on the cross. You know, people often wonder how Old Testament believers were saved, since salvation is only through Jesus Christ. They were saved on the same basis as believers today are saved, by the finished work of Christ. See, and part of Christ's work as mediator of the new covenant was the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. One of the first accomplishments of Jesus' death was to redeem all those who had believed in God under the old covenant. After Christ died, they saw what they had only been before able to them as a promise. It was, a, it was a certain promise, it was a guaranteed promise, but until the Messiah's atoning death, it was an unfulfilled promise. See, the point being made here to the writer's original readers, who were Jews, both saved and unsaved, is that Christ's atoning death was retro retroactive, pardon me. You know, Yom Kippur, which was just celebrated um, about nine or ten days ago, was last, not this, past Thursday, but the Thursday before. And the day with the Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, also pictured symbolically what Christ's atonement did actually. And it too was retroactive. When the high priest sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, the unintentional sins, the unintentional sins of the people were covered for the previous year. And, and Paul he, uh, in, in Romans chapter 3, he presents that same truth to his readers. And he teaches that we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. And that was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins that were previously committed. You can mark down Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. See, God satisfied 
when a man puts his faith in the shed blood of Christ. See, because his blood was, was not shed until hundreds or even thousands of years after many of those Old Testament believers died, their salvation was, so to speak, kind of put on credit, if I could put it that way, okay? By their obedient faith in God, they were credited. They were credited with what Jesus Christ, their promised Messiah, would one day do on their behalf, on the behalf, and also on the behalf of all sinners who've ever lived and who will ever live. And see, knowing this, God was forbearing and patient. And until the true sacrifice was made, when he saw a true heart of faith, he passed over their sins. In a deeper sense, the sacrifice had already been made in God's mind long before it was made in human history. Because God's works were finished from the foundation of the world. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 19 and 20, and Revelation 13, 8 allude to that fact. So from the human perspective, okay, the Old Testament saints could only look forward to salvation. See, so the Old Testament sacrifices were, were not the means of salvation, but marks of faithful obedience and symbols of the one perfect sacrifice that would be the means of salvation. Now, the, the uh, eternal inheritance of the Old Testament saints could not... Uh, the eternal inheritance that the Old Testament saints could not receive without Christ's death was salvation, the total forgiveness that alone could bring total access to God. The new covenant was ratified by the death of Jesus Christ, okay, and provided the full salvation that Israel had been hoping for since the very beginning. Uh, this truth introduces the subject of the death of, the death of Christ, the Messiah. The idea of which had always been a stumbling block to Jews. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23 tells us that. And despite the predictions of his death in their own scriptures, you can of course see Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, it was a truth that they preferred to ignore, if not actually outright deny. They had constructed their own ideas about the Messiah. Many of these ideas were scriptural, some were only partially scriptural, and some were totally, completely unscriptural altogether. They could not be faulted, of course, for having a limited understanding of the Messiah, for God had only given to them limited revelation. The problem was that they had ignored some messianic truth and had tried to fill in the blanks on their own, and a, and a dying Messiah simply did not fit into their theology. So we're going to talk about, and I don't know, I don't think we're going to get too far into this now, but we're going to talk about the necessity of the Messiah's death. Now, being very much aware of that theological blind spot, the writer of Hebrews proceeds to give three reasons that it was necessary for the Messiah to die. And the first one is the fact that a, a testament demands death. That's number one. It's probably the only one we're going to get to look at today because there are time restraints here. But a testament demands death. Number two, forgiveness demands blood. And number three, judgment demands a substitute. So let us look at that first one, a testament demands death. And let's look at, uh, we're in chapter 9. Let's look at verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17. It says, for where there is a testament there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Okay. Uh, another way of putting that verse, I'm going to read that to you. It says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Okay, so right there, a testament by its very nature, requires the death of the, test, of the person that made the testament. Um, the, the covenant or testament, though that word covenant or testament, is from the Greek word uh, diathik. Sure. And it, the basic meaning of that word corresponds closely to that of our present day English word of a will, where a person makes up a will, um, uh, and of course that will does not take effect 
until the person who made the will passes away. Until that time, its benefits and provisions are actually only promises and necessarily future, okay? The point being made in verses 16 and 17 is very simple and obvious. In relevance to the Old Covenant, however, was anything but obvious to the Jews that were being addressed here. So the writer briefly explains how it applies. So building on verse 15, he's saying that God gave a legacy. Uh, he gave an eternal inheritance to Israel in the form of a covenant, in the form of a will, if you will. <laughs> and as with any will, it was only a type. It was a, a type of a promissory note, all right? until the provider of the will passed away, until the provider of the will died. And at this point, no mention is made of who the, the testator is or of how Christ fills that role in life and death. All right, well, praise the Lord. That's where I'm going to leave it here today. Uh, we're going to go on next week. We're going to break these other two uh, points down. We're talking about the fact of the necessity for the Messiah's death. And as I said, we looked at the Testament demands death. Number two is forgiveness demands blood. Uh, so we'll look at that to, uh, next week. And number three, judgment demands a substitute. So praise God. I trust that you learned something from this today as we continue the study in the book of Hebrews. Thank you for being here today. God bless you, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Amen. Thank you.